Kazuki Caruso and Rei Suwa are partners in crime in more ways than one. But their lives are turned upside down in a way they could never imagine when they take in a four-year-old girl looking for a father. A well-dressed man walks out of a private plane parked in a hangar, greeting the leader of a small group of people waiting for him. He asks one of his people to come forward and a man walks up, opening a briefcase filled with expensive jewelry. The man being shown the contents of the case appears satisfied, and both parties head off into a separate location to continue the deal. They leave the airport in three cars, but unbeknownst to them, they are being followed by a man on a motorcycle. While on the freeway, the biker suddenly throws a spike strip at a car in the rear, causing it to flip over. He then rushes forward and starts shooting at the vehicle in the middle. After a tense shootout, he's able to hit one of the vehicles, disabling it. He tries to gain control of the front vehicle where the leaders both are, but they manage to shake him off. The car pulls in next to some warehouses by a dock, both men looking behind them to see if they've managed to escape the biker. As they turn around, they're shocked to see their assailant standing there waiting for them. They yell at the driver to run him over when the driver suddenly turns back, shooting one of them, revealing he'd been working with the biker all along. The accomplices drag the other into one of the warehouses and interrogate him, questioning how he's able to smuggle the jewelry. As the man pleads ignorance and begs for his life, the driver's phone starts ringing. He picks up the call, which turns out to be from a daycare informing him his daughter Miri is feeling unwell. The driver Kazuki starts reprimanding the biker Ray, berating him for not paying attention to Miri's condition. While the two are in mid-argument, the confused smuggler attempts to interrupt them, pissing them off in the process. Ray puts a bullet in the man, and the two run up to the daycare to pick up Miri. Several months earlier, the two hitmen were tasked with infiltrating a Christmas Eve party at a fancy hotel and assassinating a major human trafficker. Kazuki comes home from spending the night with a staff member from the hotel in order to clone her office ID, only to find a stray cat running around their apartment that Ray had picked up. Irritated, he tells Ray that people in their profession aren't in any position to be taking care of anyone. So, unless he's prepared to care for them from start to finish, he shouldn't bring them into their lives. Taking the cat back, he puts the kitten in a box and leaves after covering it with his scarf. The pair spend the day making preparations for the job, include buying Santa costumes and baking a cake to use as a cover for entering. Meanwhile, a small four-year-old girl travels to the nearby area on a train and after asking people for directions all day, ends up at the same hotel the night of the party. While Kazuki manages to talk his way into the guarded elevator leading up to the top floor, the little girl walks by. Upon setting the delicious cake Kazuki's hauling up, she gets into the elevator right as the doors close. With Kazuki frozen in disbelief by this sudden development, the little girl, whose name is Miri, exclaims the cake looks super tasty. Snapping out of shock, Kazuki smiles and offers her a taste. While she happily eats the cake, she asks Kazuki if he was here to fulfill her wish of seeing her father. She'd never seen her father before, but her mother told her he'd be here tonight. Kazuki tells her he'll grant her wish, so long as she listens to him. But she rushes out of the elevator as soon as it reaches the top floor. Ray, who'd been in hiding under the cart the whole time, shoots two confused guards outside the elevator and they both run after Miri. Ray manages to kill the remaining guards before bursting into the ballroom and causing a panic stampede. As gunfire erupts from both sides, Miri manages to slip away from Kazuki. Running up to the stage where their target is standing, she asks him if he's her father and the man takes Miri hostage. To save her, Kazuki throws some nearby desserts at them before yelling at Miri to jump by claiming he was her father. The excited girl slips away from her captor who's shot in the leg by Ray. Now with a clear shot at the target, Ray hits him with a headshot. Ray shoots the window out and repels his way down the hotel while Kazuki sheds his costume and makes his way through the panicked crowd holding Miri and yelling for people to let his daughter through. The two escape successfully fleeing home with Miri, who manages to fall asleep along the way. Back home, they go through her bag and to their shock, find she actually was the illegitimate child of the man they'd just taken out. The next morning, a sleepy Kazuki is woken by a loud banging on his bedroom door, only to find a very desperate Miri looking for a toilet. Once the emergency is taken care of, he starts making breakfast for everyone. Miri, who finds Kazuki cooking very interesting, insists on helping him, to which he firmly refuses. Not taking no for an answer, Miri starts causing trouble in her quest to crack some eggs and the ensuing ruckus wakes Ray up. Sensing an opportunity, 
Kazuki foists Rei with the kid and tells her that Rei has a lot of video games that she can play. With her, now wreaking havoc with Rei's video game library, Kazuki finishes making breakfast. As they all sit down to eat, they read the note Miri's mother wrote her father. In it, they are able to surmise Miri's father was cheating on his wife with Miri's mother, but abandoned her after she got pregnant. The letter reads that he should either raise her himself or pay all child support she needed over the past four years. With her dad now dead and no return address on the letter, the two seem stumped on what to do next. They distract her with a children's TV show and head out to meet their information broker and assignment supplier, Kitaru. While Kitaru isn't impressed by the flashy execution of their previous job, he gives them their payment along with a new, urgent contract. They take their payment, though Kazuki gives a chunk of it back to Kitaru to pass on to another individual asking him if the previous target had a child. Kitaru agrees to look into it and the pair return home only to find it in shambles. Soon after the two leave, another person summarily walks in whom Kitaru appears to be a bit wary of. The man, Ojinu Ryu, tells Kitaru he'll be in town for a while, asking him to keep Ojino in mind for any future work. The two make preparations and finally head out to hit their target a well-protected drug kingpin, but as they're about to leave the house, Miri makes a fuss about wanting to go with them. They try to distract her with snacks and TV, but this time their efforts fail, and Miri starts making a racket which attracts the attention of the neighbors. With no choice, they decide to bring her with them, which goes about as well as one would expect. Miri's tiny bladder wrecks their carefully thought out plan, blowing their cover turning the whole operation into a wild goose chase around the house, ending with Kazuki and Miri surrounded by a room full of thugs. Before things turn dire, they're rescued by Rei rushing onto the scene with some precision gunfire. Thanks to cover fire, they manage to get out of there alive, but fail to assassinate the target. Once back home, they receive a call from a very unimpressed Kitaru who tells the duo that he will have someone else clean up after them. He also informs them that he found the address of their previous target's mistress. The pair decide to take Miri back to the mother first thing the next morning while Kitaru sends Ojino after the drug kingpin. That night, Ojino goes to the target's compound, kills all his guards before shooting at the target. The next morning at breakfast, Ray watches Kazuki play around with Miri and asks him if he's really going to send her back to her mom. A suddenly somber Kazuki replies he has no choice, since there isn't a place for a kid like her in their world. They later take Miri to her mother's place of work, a bar where she works as a singer. Miri and Ray wait in the car and watch while Kazuki heads inside. Miri quickly gets bored, forcing Ray to take her to a nearby park. While there, he asks Miri why she calls Kazuki Papa. Miri tells him that Papa is the person who saves you when you're in trouble. Her words bring Ray back to a childhood memory when his father gave him a knife and forced him to fight with a dog. Upon his failure, ten, it's life, shooting the dog in the head. As he walked away, he chastised Ray for calling him dad, telling him to only refer to him as boss. Ray notices Miri had run off while he had been lost in his own thoughts. Running all over the place looking for her, he finally finds her talking to some police officers who try taking Miri to their station. Miri starts to scream, asking for her papa to come take her home. Ray, who had been watching this from a distance, walks up to the officers, telling them to give Miri to him, as he is her papa. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the bar, Kazuki tries to get Misaki to take Miri back but a drunk Mizaki claimed she never wanted her in the first place and had to give up her hopes and dreams to take care of the kid. The two argue until Kazuki decides he's had enough. He pays for his drink, leaving the bar. Walking outside, he meets the excited Miri being carried around by Rei. Smiling, he tells Rei that they should get something to eat on their way home. The three head back to their new lives and Miri continues to wreak absolute havoc around the house. Exhausted by her shenanigans and with no energy, the pair decide to enroll Miri in daycare to help alleviate some of the burden. Forging all the paperwork, botching many interviews at the same time, they manage to get Miri enrolled. To make a great first impression, they buy the most expensive things they can get their hands on. While the pair certainly make an impression on all the moms at the daycare, Miri in turn has a hard time making friends as her clothes make her stand out. A couple days go by and Kazuki finds himself picking up an increasingly dejected Miri from the daycare. After talking to her teacher Anna and finding the cause behind the problem, all three go on another shopping spree at an affordable retail chain store recommended by Anna. They buy everything they can get their hands on, 
and the next day Kazuki helps Miri smooth things over with other kids by playing soccer with them. That night, he picks up a cheerful Miri with a smile on his face, and back home surprises her with her very own fully decorated room. The situation at home begins to settle down, and Kazuki analyzes their finances. After spending all they did on Miri, finds that they've nearly run out of money. Both Kazuki and Rei go to Kataro begging for work and are laden with many smaller assignments that they must complete within the week. While dividing up the work between them, they get a call from Miri's daycare informing them that Miri will have to stay home for a few days because there's been a viral infection making the rounds among the kids. Working on the jobs while taking care of Miri proves to be too much for the two. After pulling three consecutive all-nighters, Kazuki decides to head off and ask Kataru for help. Meanwhile, he leaves Rei in charge, but the exhausted Rei falls asleep while on watch. Miri, curious to see what kind of work Kazuki does, decides to follow after him. Surprisingly, she manages to keep up with him for most of the way, but gets distracted by a dog and loses him when he enters Kataru's coffee shop. Waking up to find no one at home, Rei calls Kazuki to see if he'd taken Miri with him. This realization makes them both panic and they rush out into the streets looking for her. Miri, meanwhile, ends up back near Kitara's shop, who recognizes her from when he was researching her parents. Kazuki and Rei regroup at Kitara's only to find Miri inside drinking fruit juice. Panicking because they had not told Kitaru Miri was living with them, Kazuki tries to pretend she's just some kid they're babysitting. Kitaru questions their progress on his jobs, and after hearing about their sleepless state, offers to look after Miri while the pair finish work. They complete all their assignments within a single day and come back to find Miri dozing off. They try to hurry out the store in case Miri sleep talks her way into blowing their cover, but Kitaru reveals he had known she was with them all along. He informs him he'd intended to take action if it appeared she was interfering with their work. But after spending the day with her and hearing how much she loved them, he began to understand why they'd taken her in. He reminds them they were the ones who killed her real father, and in their line of work, could themselves end up dead or put Miri in danger. Only if they understand these risks should they continue down this path. He leaves them with a final warning, that if Miri leads them to betray the organization, the consequences would be dire pointing out that Rei would know this better than anyone. With Miri now properly in their care, Kazuki begins to worry about his parenting style and how it could affect Miri's future. Promising himself that he'll be attentive to make sure Miri doesn't turn out like him, he becomes excited to learn that Miri had an altercation with one of her classmates, sensing a great opportunity to flex his parenting skills. But in his gusto, he ends up upsetting Miri. She felt as if he were blaming her for the fight, which caused her to lash out at him and cling to Rei. This breakdown in his relationship causes Kazuki's worries to spiral, and he ends up forgetting to pack Miri's lunch for her daycare trip to the zoo the next day. Even though parents are forbidden from showing up, he drags Rei with him, and both end up following Miri's class from a distance at the zoo. There they see Miri, her friends, and Tega, the boy Miri got into a fight with wandering around lost because they all ran away from the group when Tega had insisted on visiting the lion's cage. Although Kazuki initially has a mini breakdown seeing a boy with his little girl, he and Rei decide to follow the group without being seen to make sure they're okay. <laughs> As the lost group walk around the zoo, Miri takes charge and ends up becoming friends with and taking care of Tega. Seeing her be so responsible makes Kazuki recognize the error in his approach and he promises to trust her more from now on. The kids are reunited with their daycare group and later that day when Miri gets back home, she jumps into Kazuki's embrace, having forgotten all about their fight. The tearful Kazuki enthusiastically hugs her back while Rei looks on at his hopeless partner. Some time passes and the rainy season arrives, bringing with it a change to Kazuki's mood. With his thoughts occupied with sad memories, he becomes short-tempered when his domestic duties become too much for him to handle. Rei's lack of help around the house only compounds the issue. He brings it up with him, only to receive an enthusiasm in return. One day, while listening to Miri and Rei complain about the vegetables in their dinner, he snaps and angrily steps away from the dinner table. The next day, Rei wakes up to a hungry Miri asking for food and finds that Kazuki had left the house, leaving behind a note telling them he'd be out for a while. Huh? 
With the house in disarray, a panicked Ray tries to make do by playing video games with Miri and ordering home delivery. Meanwhile, Kazuki complains about his problems to Kataru, who simply smiles, telling Kazuki he's changed a lot. He then brings out the envelopes with money that Kazuki had given him, informing Kazuki that his sister-in-law Karen had refused the cash. He tells Kazuki that it's been five years, and he needs to talk to Karen himself. But Kazuki, unwilling to listen, simply leaves the cafe. He proceeds to spend the entire day gambling and drinking and ends up in a fist fight with a group of people out in the street. While he sits there, beaten and bruised, he's reached out to by a woman who turns out to be Karen. The two exchange some words before Kazuki turns to leave. This angers Karen, who tells him to stop avoiding her because he isn't the one who killed her sister. But he bitterly affirms her that it was his fault and walks off. As he does, he remembers a similar rainy night when he had been chasing a target between some back alleyways. The man managed to put some distance between them and hijacked a car. Sniper, presumably working with Kazuki, shot out the tires, causing the car to crash into a fuel truck. Kazuki caught up to the scene, only to find his pregnant wife Yuzuko standing next to the site of the car crash. He panicked and screamed her name when the fuel suddenly ignited, erupting into an explosion. Back home, Ray wakes up the next day with Miri sleeping on top of him and notices her suffering from a fever. He searches all over the house, but is unable to find any children's medication and realizes he doesn't know the way to a hospital either, causing him to finally understand what made Kazuki so angry. Meanwhile, Kazuki visits his wife's grave before going to the gazebo in the park where they had met for the first time. Karen, knowing she could find him here, arrives at the gazebo and the two have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Kazuki tells her that he struggles with changing because he fears it would cause the memory of her to fade. But Karen objects that Yuzuko wouldn't want this for him. She would want him to be happy. She reveals she had heard about him taking care of a child from Kataro and tells him to find happiness with her. This breaks Kazuki out of his funk and he goes back home, which he finds in disarray with some medicine on the bedside table and both Ray and Miri fast asleep. Realizing what had happened, he looks over at Ray and smiles. One day in August, Ray is called home by his father for an important meeting. With Ray out the house, Kazuki and Miri begin decorating the place for his surprise birthday party. Ray visits his family compound and meets with his dad for the first time in three years. His father tells him he has spent enough time out there on his own and that it's time for him to come back and learn the ins and outs of the organization so he can one day take over the family's assassination business. Sensing Ray's hesitation, his father threatens Kazuki's life in response, which causes Ray to panic and ask his father for more time. His father allows him to settle his affairs, but gives him a job that needs taking care of before the end of the day. The job of assassinating his old weapons instructor, who had chosen to betray the family because of a woman. He's driven to the location where his instructor is expected to be by Ajino, who works for the Zawa family, and reveals they've already taken care of the woman. Ray meets with his old instructor at the docks next to a getaway boat. Upon learning that his lover has been killed, the two get into a firefight, where the man skillfully fights back and slowly retreats up the stairs, inside a nearby warehouse moving up to the roof. There, he sets up an ambush for Ray, and the two get into an intense knife fight. With the two going at it, the former instructor mocks Ray for being an unfeeling puppet with no purpose in life other than serving the Suwa family. Ray manages to get the upper hand and accidentally pushes his old teacher off the roof. Ajino heads off to dispose of the man's body while Ray stays behind to clear his head. Kazuki tracks Ray's phone and goes over to pick him up. They reminisce about the first time they met and the early days of their relationship. Ray questions Kazuki, asking him if he thinks they can ever change, to which Kazuki laughingly replies that he has no idea. The two arrive home when they wake up a sleeping Miri who sings Ray happy birthday. Forcing a rare smile out of him. A few months pass, with Ray not making any moves to rejoin the family business. October rolls around and Miri starts training for a track and field day at daycare. On the day of the meet, the pair cheer Miri on as she competes in various events. 
They invite her friends and their moms to eat lunch with them, during which Miri eats the rice balls Rei had made especially for her. As the main racing event begins, the two papas get nervous, and seeing Miri compete in the race with all her might leads Rei to start loudly cheering for her. This surprises Miri so much so, she trips and ends up losing the race. A depressed and gloomy Rei sits around moping while Kazuki and Miri participate in the parent-child race. Before reaching the final stage, which involves a scavenger hunt, they engage in a variety of obstacle games. Miri reads the item she needs to scavenge for and runs up to grab Rei. Kazuki and Rei both pick up Miri and race to the finish line, winning them a gold medal. At the end of the race, Rei asks Miri what the scavenger hunt card said. She takes it out of her pocket and gives it to him when he opens it, to find that the item she had been tasked with was finding family. This brings a small smile out of Rei and a fountain of tears out of Kazuki. But while they're enjoying themselves, the Suwa family puts some added pressure on Rei. They send Ajino to Kataro with an array of photos of the three at the track to threaten him into compliance. Winter arrives, and soon Christmas is just around the corner. The children at the daycare are taught to sing Silent Night for the upcoming Christmas party, which Miri reveals is one she used to sing with her mother. Kazuki and Rei come to the daycare to pick Miri up where they see a woman standing outside the gate. As they approach, they realize it is Miri's mother, Mizaki. Questioning her presence, she informs them that she came to take Miri back. Kazuki begins arguing with her, but is stopped by Rei when Miri exits the daycare and rushes over to embrace Mizaki. They decide to bring Mizaki home with them to have a conversation. Miri excitedly brings Mizaki around the house showing off her room and the things Kazuki and Rei had bought her before Mizaki hugs Miri and apologizes for leaving her. They all eat dinner together and after Miri falls asleep, they remain at the dinner table. Mizaki reveals she hit rock bottom and had been diagnosed with cancer. The disease had spread to the point that she could no longer sing. With no idea how much longer she had to live, she wants to spend whatever time she has left with Miri. Apologizing to the pair, she begs them to let her take back Miri. Before leaving for the night, she tells them that their jobs make them unqualified to care for Miri, and if they cared for her, they indeed would let her go. Kazuki and Rei go to Kataro's coffee shop to discuss the matter, wondering how Mizaki had found out where they live and what exactly they do. Kataro informs them that he had told her. He shows them the pictures Ajino had shared with him and reveals to them the danger they and Miri were in from the Suwa family. This decision is the best outcome for all parties involved and that their lives together was simply a dream that had to come to an end. The next day, Kazuki comes to a decision and brings Rei and Miri to a shopping mall for one final family day. They spend the entire day doing all sorts of fun activities, buying her toys, new clothes, and sharing a giant crepe. Finally, at night, they sit on a Ferris wheel and enjoy the view together as a family. They meet with Mizaki and tell Miri that their final present for her today is a sleepover at her mom's. The pair watch as Miri walks away with her mom, Kazuki remarking they weren't able to change after all. The next few days listlessly pass by, with the house mostly silent in Miri's absence. Rei informs Kazuki of his intention to return to his father after the year ends. He offers the apartment to Kazuki who declines, the place being but too big for a single person. Rei meets with his father and notifies him of his decision. His father accepts, but says there is something that must be done beforehand. He tosses a picture of Kazuki and Miri on the table and informs Rei that his old ties must be purged so that they don't become his shackles. Beginning with his father to change his mind, he ultimately refuses. <laughs> Leaving the room, Rei calls Kazuki, urging him to rush to Miri and protect her immediately. They try to reach Mizaki, but it's already too late. Ajino had arrived at the house and shot her. Before he can finish the job, Kazuki arrives and attempts to fend Ajino off, though he's quickly overpowered. Kazuki tries to distract him when he reveals that he had called the police prior to his arrival. 
Sounds of sirens come from outside the building and an officer calls for Ajino to drop his weapon. Ajino tells Kazuki he'll deal with him shortly before making his escape. Kataro enters the apartment having been the one impersonating a cop simply to scare Ajino off. He grabs the still sleeping Miri and asks Kazuki to hurry before the real police arrive. Kazuki holds Mizaki and tries to stifle the bleeding, but it's little too late. She dies in his arms, telling him to protect Miri and to let her know that she's sorry. Kitaro drives the two to a safe house where they meet up with Rei. Kazuki argues to leave Miri at an orphanage far away and cutting off all contact with her. Rei convinces him otherwise to work together with him to protect her and so they can live as a family once more. They take Miri home and the next day on Christmas morning drop her off at the daycare. They tell her that her mother had to go on a trip, but that they promised to take over in her stead. They grab some weapons and Santa Claus outfits from Kataro before heading to the Sawa family compound. Overpowering the guards, they forcefully bust their way into the facility. The two reach the main building, though their car gets riddled with bullets in the process. Using smoke bombs, they enter and subdue the guards in the foyer. With their path forward now blocked by Ajino, a shootout commences between him and Ray. Ray tells him that he's just here to talk with his father, but Ajino refuses to cease fire. He manages to corner Ray, but Kazuki distracts him, luring Ajino away in turn. Catching up to Kazuki in the kitchen, he nearly kills him when he's interrupted by Ray. They tussle, and Ajino gains the upper hand, choking Ray when he's ultimately stabbed in the back by Kazuki. Ray pushes Ajino down onto his back and is skewered by the knife. Ray tasks Kazuki with finding an escape vehicle before entering his father's office to tell him he's leaving the organization for good. He confides in his father that living away from him had taught him many things and that he can no longer go back to being his puppet. To sever his relationship with his family once and for all, Ray shoots himself in the arm, telling his father he is useless to the Sawa family now, before walking away. At the daycare, Miri sings Silent Night with her entire class, with the parents sitting in the audience. She looks around, but she doesn't see Kazuki or Ray among them. Suddenly, they enter the room wearing their Santa outfits and wave at her, making her smile. After the song finishes, she rushes towards them to embrace them, and the trio get their picture taken by Miri's teacher. Ten years later, on the top floor of a restaurant by a beach, a young girl puts on her high school outfit for the very first time. Kazuki calls Miri to come down, telling her it's time to go to school. She wishes a picture of her mom goodbye, heads downstairs where an older Kazuki and Rei are cleaning the restaurant and cooking breakfast. She shows off her uniform to them, causing Kazuki to tear up. Rei hands her a delicious breakfast, which she gulps down. To commemorate this special day, she then brings the two outside the restaurant and the three take a family selfie together. The picture goes on a board inside the restaurant, covered with photos of the three as well as other friends and family. Photos that have been gathered throughout the past 10 years of their lives together.